I want to begin by noting that McCarthy's earlier novels uh, clearly inhabit uh, the territory of Southern Gothic, but Blood Meridian does mark a shift. It moves figuratively from the American South to the American West, and it shifts also his concerns and focus from the violence concealed under the ostensibly respectable and righteous lives of American Southerners to the unconcealed violent history of the American frontiersmen of the 19th century in the West. And as a kind of preliminary, I want to consider in general the imagery of the West, the myth of the frontier, the values of violence that are expressed through cultural portrayals of the West. And I thought to alert you to this uh, little known, except to my ex-students, uh, this little known 1972 film, I do not uh, particularly counsel you to watch it, um, The Culpepper Cattle Company. Uh, and this was uh, a film which was at the beginning of a trend of hyper-real or hyper-realist cowboy movies. And I want to kind of highlight that as a kind of a foil to McCarthy's novel, which has been characterised itself as an anti-Western, because one might also well see this film as a kind of anti-Western. And so I want to begin with the icon of American violence as regeneration, the cowboy. Uh, now, just in general, we're all familiar with the iconography of the cowboy from the usual places, from film, TV, from advertising, uh, even from politics and from music. The name John Wayne embedded in American cultural representations, but also his offspring, people like the Marlboro Man I'm thinking of whose image advertised cigarettes, or Ronald Reagan himself, who was mentioned earlier, whose own role as a cowboy in B-movies propelled him eventually towards the US presidency. The rhinestone cowboy of country and western music, of Willie Nelson and Dolly Parton, all of these represent a particular set of identifiable American values, but this iconography is clearly a retrospectively invented one, a fiction which does not accord with the reality of life on the frontier in the 19th century. This film was part of a gesture towards remedying that. Um, <sighs> modern figures, in fact, suggest to us, uh, modern sociological and historical studies suggest to at most, there were perhaps 20,000 cowboys in real life. That many only ever did one drive up one trail, escorting a cattle herd. That there were very often young, inexperienced men, usually the sons of farmers. That they were racially mixed, being of Mexican and Spanish and Indian descent as well as European. That they were therefore immigrant descended as well as being internal emigrants of a kind that their skills were limited to the handling of horses and cattle. And with uh, employment prospects after the Civil War for such young men being scarce and uninteresting, the ardours of cattle drive was perhaps an economic necessity as well as an adventure. And the economics of cattle drives were those of mass movement of natural resources from one area to another in the service of a very few large-scale landowners and cattle barons. They would work in teams, never alone, usually perhaps of eight to ten men, in order to control an average herd of two to two and a half thousand cattle. And this perhaps starts to explain why I do not suggest that you watch this film, because the life of a cowboy was extremely boring, consisting of moving cows from one place to another. But somehow, since the 1860s, the cowboy has been transformed into an American ideal, a folk hero of rugged individualism. And the traces of influence of this fictional version of the cowboy persist everywhere in American culture, from Chandler's Philip Marlowe, right up to Blade Runner. <laughs> 
The cowboy myth, then, brings into focus one of the oldest dichotomies in American myth appear. That of the individual who is self-sufficient, supportive of, but not dependent on, a part of communities. A whole series of American comic book heroes, for example, um, also follow that formula of exclusion from their own communities, which, however, they support by violent intervention against external threats from evil. There's a strange paradox here, of course, where the cowboy archetype is always a loner supporting a community, yet that community is threatened not by another loner, but by a posse or a corporate body. And that paradox, for me, exemplifies the idea that in American mythology, fear of the mob, the mafia or what have you, is not such an exclusively 20th century idea a fear of communism in disguise, but had existed long before such wide-scale political concerns. It's also related to uh, the characteristics of American religion, of small sect preaching particularly, a combination of a vision of future splendor for the righteous poor combined with hellfire for the evil. And that kind of, for me, reflects the suffering of ordinary lives and the desire for retribution and social reform in the here and now, not in the hereafter. And this perhaps might resonate with our earlier discussion about the right, or about, not necessarily neoliberal, but conservative values and how they're expressed. Not just through the novel for me, but through the form of the novel, through the type of novel that McCarthy has chosen to write in this particular novel. <clears throat> in America in the 19th century, the churches that existed were in a situation where they had to adapt to new industrial capitalism. And they followed a classic pattern of development, ceasing to be revolutionary, departing from the 18th century, becoming short-term active protest movements uh, and becoming slowly more organized, an organized kind of cult which signified its rejection of the evil in the modern world by withdrawing from it in a mediatized act of mass self-violence. We know these from the 20th century, from the second half. For example, in the Branch Davidians uh, or the Heaven's Gate sect and so many others of recent times, and all of those cults embraced the same moral dualism that obsessed the Puritans of an elect, a chosen few, and a preterite, those who are left behind. All of these Americans awaiting a future promising apocalypse or rapture. Now, in this movie, as in Blood Meridian, these themes are explicitly foregrounded. We have land barons pit against a nomadic mob of homesteaders who are a threat to the business of cattle, but who find themselves defended by individualistic cowboys whose own economic interests are, however, allied with the business of cattle. What we see in this film is the cowboy representing a kind of common sense middle way between individualistic capitalism and euphoric, delirious, religious communism. And in this way, the cowboy becomes a kind of guardian of America's manifest destiny. But he also becomes the parasite of capitalism at the same time, because he occupies a rational space in between these two incommensurable possibilities. And his complexity expresses the peculiarly American relation between Puritanism and violence, between Old Testament moral values and retribution. Both in this film and in Blood Meridian, we have tales which explicitly set out at their beginnings as tales of initiations of a naive young man 
who on the journey west up the trail will, through a rite of violence, become both the hand of a retributive god and the mediator of a new landscape existing between the two historical Americas, between the virgin land of manifest destiny and the corporate industrialized, industrialized land of modernity, between the religious ideal of a new Jerusalem and the urban technological utopia on earth. The values of this young naïf will be constructed through his experience of being excluded from both societies, and yet he will depend on the one and fight for the other. In Blood Meridian, the kid will be recruited to fight in the 1846 war with Mexico over Texas. Yet he will not be purely idealistic, but also explicitly mercenary. He will lose his naivety through his initiation into violence, and yet he will remain monastic, even preferring the company of other men, and perhaps a horse can get one, and a gun, hopefully, to the corruptions of women. Figuratively, then, such a character functions as a sort of avenging angel, theologically. Militant in the sense that he will fight on a side in a holy war. Even after the Civil War was over, that sense of militancy in America's wars, that sense of holy purpose, well, it persists today. I'm not just talking about wars in Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria, or the war against terror. But I'm thinking more mundane things, like um, the Jesus Army and their Jesus Army bus. It infects mainstream American religious and political thinking. And the interesting thing for me is that it's therefore not just Islam that has a concept of jihad or holy war, but it's also deeply embedded in American thinking. This is for me where uh, McCarthy and this novel start to feel really, really timely, almost before their time. We've talked about how he's related to the contemporary and to the recent past, to Vietnam. Also, it seems that he was prophetic, proleptic, that this was also a novel for America's immediate future. So I want to tease out some of these themes by looking at, um, I'll just read one brief section with you. And um, it's on page 326. And it's the kid's hallucination. It's at the bottom of the page where it starts. In his delirium, it begins. In his delirium, he ransacked the lin linens of his pallet for arms, but there were none. The judge smiled. The fool was no longer there but another man, and this other man he could never see in his entirety, but he seemed an artisan and a worker in metal. The judge enshadowed him where he crouched at his trade, but he was a cold forger who worked with hammer and die perhaps under some indictment and an exile from men's fires, hammering out like his own conjectural destiny all through the night of his becoming some coinage for a dawn that would not be. It is this false moneyer with his gravers and burins who seeks favour with the judge, and he is at contriving from cold slag brute in the crucible a face that will pass, an image that will render this residual specie current in the markets where men barter. Of this is the judge judge, and the night does not end. This is the bit I'll comment on just briefly, and then I'll read the end. So the kid is etherized here. <coughs> 
he's had the arrow removed from his leg surgically and he is either hallucinating or seeing or a combination of both the judge. The judge who at the end of the novel will lead the dance. The judge who has been the only voice of wisdom, if we accept that there is any wisdom to be had, yet who also appears to be a Satan of a kind. But here, the hallucination does not solely include the judge, but also this other character, this cold forger, forging coinage. He appears to be uh, an almost Hephaestos-like character um, in Greek mythology, the smith god. Hardly a god then, but rather some acolyte of Satan here who makes the false coin that is the gold of the American West. Caesar's coin, not God's, graven with whatever contingent temporal image of man is current. The other things that I'd like to point out here um, and that I'd like you to be thinking about or suggest you think about when I read the next session are the rhetorical strengths of this passage. And let me just point to a few of the ways in which McCarthy is structuring this. Some of the hallmarks of his prose, the tumbling effect of anadiplosis in the repetition of the fool was no longer there but another man and this other man he and then the clause pursues its path. The antanaclasis of the repetition of judge, antanaclasis being where the word is repeated but its meaning is changed, though it is the same word. The hallmarks of syntheton, the simple conjunction of two words, gravers and burins, and systrophy, the piling on of repeated terms that ought really to add up to a definition of something, but actually don't quite when you examine what has been defined by these piled up adjectives or nouns. These, the hallmarks of McCarthy's prose that seem to me to lend the impression of definition, but ultimately are undermined by the two plosies, the two doublings, the two repetitions that are nervous by simultaneously confirming and confounding. So that other man, other man, or judge, judge. The positive negates the positive, but also does the reverse. A little bit like the coinage with the graven image. So let me then turn towards um, the end of the novel, and I want to I want to begin on page three four eight and read to the end, not including the epilogue. I want to begin with uh, a man seeks his own destiny, right in the middle of the page. A man seeks his own destiny and no other, said the judge, will or nil. Any man who could discover his own fate and elect therefore some opposite course could only come at last to that selfsame reckoning at the same appointed time, for each man's destiny is as large as the world he inhabits and contains within it all opposites as well. This desert upon which so many have been broken is vast and calls for largeness of heart but it is also ultimately empty, it is hard, it is barren, its very nature is stone. He poured the tumbler full, drink up, he said. The world goes on, we have dancing nightly and this night is no exception. The straight and the winding way are one and now that you are here, what do the years count since we last two met together? Man's memories are uncertain and the past that was different lift Dif the past that was differs little from the past that was not. He took up the tumbler the judge had poured and he drank and set it down again. He looked at the judge. I've been everywhere, he said. This is just one more place. 
The judge arched his brow. Did you post witnesses, he said, to report to you on the continuing existence of those places once you quit them? That's crazy, is it? Where is yesterday? Where is Glanton and Brown and where is the priest? He leaned closer. Where is Shelby, whom you left to the mercies of Elias in the desert? And where is Tate, whom you abandoned in the mountains? Where are the ladies, are the fair and tender ladies, with whom you danced at the governor's ball when you were a hero, anointed with the blood of the enemies of the Republic you'd elected to defend? And where is the fiddler, and where the dance? I guess you can tell me. I tell you this. As war becomes dishonored and its nobility called into question, those honorable men who recognize the sanctity of blood will become excluded from the dance, which is the warrior's right, and thereby will the dance become a false dance, and the dancers false dancers. And yet there will be one there always who is a true dancer. And can you guess who that one might be? You ain't nothing. You speak truer than you know. But I will tell you, only that man who has offered himself entire to the blood of war, who has been to the floor of the pit and seen horror in the round and learned at last that it speaks to it, his inmost heart, only that man can dance. Even a dumb animal can dance. The judge set the bottle on the bar. Hear me, man, he said. There is room on the stage for one beast and one alone. All others are destined for a night that is eternal and without name. One by one they will step down into the darkness before the foot lamps. Bears that dance, bears that don't. He drifted with the crowd toward the door at the rear. In the anteroom sat men at cards, dim in the smoke. He moved on. A woman was taking chits from the men as they passed through to the shed at the rear of the building. She looked up at him. He had no chit. She directed him to a table where a woman was selling the chits and stuffing the money with a piece of shingle through a narrow slit into an iron strongbox. He paid his dollar and took the stamped brass token and rendered it up at the door and passed through. He found himself in a large hall with a platform for the musicians at one end and a large homemade sheet iron stove at the other. Whole squadrons of whores were working the floor in their stained peignoirs, in their green stockings and melon-colored drawers they drifted through the smoky oil light like make-believe wantons, at once childlike and lewd. A dark little dwarf of a whore took his arm and smiled up at him. I seen you right away, she said. I always pick the one I want. She led him through a door where an old Mexican woman was handing out towels and candles, and they ascended like refugees of some sordid disaster, the darkened plank board stairwell to the upper rooms. Lying in the little cubicle with his trousers about his knees, he watched her. He watched her take up her clothes and don them, and he watched her hold the candle to the mirror and study her face there. She turned and looked at him. Let's go, she said. I gotta go. Go on. You can't lay there. Come on, I gotta go. He sat up and swung his legs over the edge of the little iron cot and stood and pulled his trousers up and buttoned them and buckled his belt. His hat was on the floor and he picked it up and slapped it against his, the side of his leg and put it on. You need to get down there and get you a drink, she said. You'll be all right. I'm all right now. He went out. He turned at the end of the hallway and looked back. Then he went down the stairs. She had come to the door. She stood in the hallway holding the candle and brushing her hair with one hand. And she watched him descend into the dark of the stairwell. And then she pulled the door shut behind her. He stood at the edge of the dance floor. A ring of people had taken the floor and were holding hands and grinning and calling out to one another. A fiddler sat on a stool on the stage and a man walked up and down calling out the order of the dance and gesturing and stepping in the way he wished them to go. Outside, 
in the darkened lot, groups of wretched Tonkawas stood in the mud with their faces composed in strange lost portraits within the sash work of the window lights. The fiddler rose and set the fiddle to his jaw. There was a shout and the music began and the ring of dancers began to rotate ponderously with a great shuffling. He went out the back. The rain had stopped and the air was cold. He stood in the yard. Stars were falling across the sky, myriad and random, speeding along brief vectors from their origins in night to their destinies in dust and nothingness. Within the hall, the fiddle squealed and the dancers shuffled and stomped. In the street, men were calling for the little girl whose bear was dead, for she was lost. They went among the darkened lots with lanterns and torches, calling out to her. He went down the walkboard towards the Jakes. He stood outside, listening to the voices fading away, and he looked again at the silent tracks of the stars where they died over the darkened hills. Then he opened the rough board door of the Jakes and stepped in. The judge was seated upon the closet. He was naked, and he rose up smiling and gathered him in his arms against his immense and terrible flesh and shot the wooden bar latch home behind him. In the saloon, two men who wanted to buy the hide were looking for the owner of the bear. The bear lay on the stage in a man's pool of blood. All the candles had gone out, save one, and it guttered uneasily in its grease like a votive lamp. In the dance hall, the young man had joined the fiddler and he kept the measure of the music with a pair of spoons which he clapped between his knees. The whores sashayed half naked, some with their breasts exposed. In the mudded dog yard behind the premises, two men went down the boards towards the jakes. A third man was standing there, urinating into the mud. Is someone in there? The first man said. The man who was relieving himself did not look up. I wouldn't go in there if I were you, he said. Is there somebody in there? I wouldn't go in. He hitched himself up and buttoned his trousers and stepped past them and went up the walk toward the lights. The first man watched him go and then opened the door of the jakes. Good God Almighty, he said. What is it? He didn't answer. He stepped past the other and went back up the walk. The other man stood looking after him. Then he opened the door and looked in. In the saloon, they had rolled the dead bear onto a wagon sheet, and there was a general call for hands. In the anteroom, the tobacco smoke circled the lamps like an evil fog, and the men bid and dealt in a low mutter. There was a lull in the dancing, and a second fiddler took the stage, and the two plucked their strings and turned the little hardwood pegs until they were satisfied. Many among the dancers were staggering drunk through the room, and some had ripped themselves of shirts and jackets and stood bare-chested and sweating, even though the room was cold enough to cloud their breath. An enormous whore stood clapping her hands at the bandstand and calling drunkenly for the music. She wore nothing but a pair of men's drawers, and some of her sisters were likewise clad in what appeared to be trophies, hats or pantaloons or blue twill cavalry jackets. As the music soared up, there was a lively cry from all, and a caller stood to the front and called out the dance, and the dancers stomped and hooted and lurched against one another. And they are dancing. The board floor slamming under the jackboots and the fiddlers grinning hideously over their canted pieces. Towering over them all is the judge, and he is naked, dancing, his small feet lively and quick, and now in double time, and bowing to the ladies, huge and pale and hairless, like an enormous infant. He never sleeps, he says. He says he'll never die. He bows to the fiddlers and sashays backwards and throws back his head, 
and laughs deep in his throat, and he is a great favorite, the judge. He wafts his hat, and the lunar dome of his skull passes palely under the lamps, and he swings about and takes possession of one of the fiddles, and he pirouettes and makes a pass, two passes, dancing and fiddling at once. His feet are light and nimble. He never sleeps. He says that he will never die. He dances in light and in shadow, and he is a great favorite. He never sleeps. The judge, he is dancing, dancing. He says that he will never die. Thank you.